Hey everybody, it is Nick here again from Grayscale Gorilla and welcome back to the Grayscale Gorilla podcast. Now, if you haven't checked out the Grayscale Gorilla podcast, uh, please head on over to iTunes. We have tons of episodes already up over there. However, this episode will be a little bit different than what you may be used to. See, what happens is every Monday or Tuesday, Chris and I and Chad from Grayscale Gorilla, we hop on a phone call kind of a video hangout, and we talk about some of the things we're gonna do this week, we talk about big projects we're working on, some of the plugins we're building, and and uh, some of the tutorials we're gonna put out. And we figured, why don't we, after that phone call, why don't we stick around and record a podcast and talk about some of the other things, other than Cinema 4D and, and, and After Effects, some of the other tools and tips and things that kind of help us become better motion designers. And so what you're about to hear is uh, the first version of that. Uh, we recorded that phone call and we get into things like our favorite productivity apps. We talk about upcoming half res, which is coming really soon in uh, Chicago, which is our uh, motion graphics and motion design event. So don't forget if you're in Chicago to stop by there. We also talk about some of the other things that have kind of influenced us over the last few weeks, things that kind of inspire us to do really the work that we do. So anyway, let's head on into the phone call and I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. All right. Well, hey guys, welcome to the new, uh, this, this trial format here for the, uh, the podcast. How's, how's everyone's week been? Busy. Yeah, super busy. busy. It was uh, Labor Day. Weekend? Did you guys do anything fun? Yeah, I celebrated my dad's seventieth birthday. Oh, that's awesome! Yep. Congrats, man. Yep, that's exciting. Which is kind of freaky when your parents start to get up into those kinds of years. <laughs> that just happens, doesn't it? You just look at your parents. You're like, "Wow, you got old. when did you when did you get old? When did that happen?" Know, and, then you, and then you realize you did too. Yeah, it's weird. Like, yeah. I swear to God, we just had his sixtieth party. Like, feels like two years ago. That's bonkers. It's nuts, man. Well, we're we're all gathered here. We figured uh, we hop on a phone call once a week to talk, uh, you know, what we're doing in uh, Grayscale Gorilla and what tutorials are coming out. And we figured let's fire up the cameras, let's fire up the mics, and and start talking. So, uh, so let's see let's see how this goes. Um, yeah, we're here to talk what, shop. Yeah, I mean, so what what's been going on in in Cinema 4D motion graphics news this week? Anybody's anything uh, happening? Just well, a, besides RE team coming out officially for everybody. Well, of course. There of you go. Course. Yeah, that's, that, the, that's big, the big one. Big, big, big one right there. So by the time this comes out, uh, people should be at least getting their uh, versions of R R18. And uh, it was announced about a month ago. And, man, I, I, uh, I've been digging all the new stuff. What's everyone's favorite new feature so far? Hmm. Well, everybody's going to talk about the new fracturing. So I'll just go in and say the knife tool. Oh, he's going deep. So uh, explain deep, to me what's for for us um uh you know <laughs> obsessed with fracture and doing nothing else for the last month. Tell me <laughs> tell me what's new with uh with all the knife stuff. Oh geez, there's so many things. I mean and it's it's fairly technical, but like the knife tool is built in now where you can do multiple cuts. In fact, when you hit K for the shortcut of knife, it pops up with three sub knife tools. Um, where you can, you know, be cutting holes, cutting straight through the object, doing multiple slices. I, there's so many different things when it comes to it. I can't, I can't even go into it right now. It'd have to be a full tutorial, but there's a lot of really nice features in it. Now, some of that stuff's in our, um, our intro or our what's new series. Is that right, Chris? Yep. I think I did cover the knife tool on that. So that's a good place to start. Yeah. We also have, uh, some tutorials coming out for R18 specifically in the next, uh, a few weeks or so we just we dropped one late last week it was uh, that rose kind of shattering and and moving around if yeah, you've seen cool. that one mm -hmm. chad uh it's good to have chad around he's got sweet ideas like that <laughs> <laughs> it's like why don't you fracture something that doesn't break I'm like oh i was i was gonna suggest maybe like an eagle comes in and grabs the rose and lands on a skull and then turn it into like <laughs> the, the, the world's most ultimate tattoo or something oh, yeah yeah <laughs> I think yeah, you're you know. overestimating my abilities, Chad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see. Like, I think what what I'm already starting to see in just having R18 out for not a very long period of time is what people are doing with the stuff that because we've all been we've had it for a while, you know, because we were on the beta, 
And so we had access to it for quite a while. And I think when you're on the beta and you have access to something early on, you, you find yourself kind of just doing similar things to what everybody else is doing with it. And when it gets open to the public, it's, it's then when you see like, oh, I never thought about even trying it like that or using this tool that way. And I think I'm already starting to see some uh, videos pop up and whatnot of people using Fracture for interesting things. And I think that's the most exciting thing for me and is just seeing like where it goes after it hits the public. Because I think like, you know, after you're on the beta forum and you like see the same kind of thing over and over again, it's exciting to see like, oh, wow, like, that's a really cool use for that tool. I didn't think about that. Well, see, that's your problem. You spend time on the forum. I you know. just got to have no influence <laughs> from anybody. Just like that, shut that's myself a, off from yeah, the world. That, well, that's, that's a worry of mine for this podcast is that I, I, I am not as plugged in on like keeping track on Twitter and Facebook and all the various things for what the industry is up to. Like I, I tend to stick a little bit more technical or maybe even insular on that. So I'm going to be learning a bunch of stuff from you guys. Oh boy! Yeah, yeah. So I guess with that in mind, you know, as as eighteen comes out and everyone starts playing around with it, we're gonna see some really cool stuff. Um, what have you guys seen over the last uh, couple weeks? You guys been digging? Well, there's that one thing I sent you with that dude. I, I we'll have to put his name in the um, in the description, but it was interesting. Like you know how you can use objects to shatter other objects, but he was actually like live drawing a spline and literally like cracking and creating fragments on an object in real time by drawing on it, which I thought was, well, not necessarily drawing on the object, but drawing on that, on that uh, plane, you know, on that view plane. And I thought that was really cool. Yep. That, um, those kind of things, seeing how people, you know, uh, use different tools together like that is really going to, you know, that reminds me of at, at Seagraph, watching Patrick uh, um, Goski. Uh, I always say it's Goski, Goski. I always mess that one up. Sorry, Sorry Patrick. Goski, I love maybe? you. Goski. Um, I he, Goski. He used an emitter with the fracture. So he, he dropped in a, the actual emitter dots um, with a regular old, you know, Cinema 40 emitter w can be used um, as a fracture. So it actually makes the pieces move. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks really, really cool. Yeah, everybody uh, so, was geeking out on that one. That was great. Yeah, all, yeah all, cool. all of the presenters were like, whoa, how'd you do that? We didn't even know it could do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what He's made like... me animate the spline that I had in there. And remember, Chad, the uh, kind of infinite twirling cycle? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I that to a GIF, but it's yeah, cool. got some upvotes on Reddit. All right. And then later, earlier this week, uh, Trevor Kerr was showing me some Houdini stuff. And because Houdini has some pretty amazing fracturing as well. And he was like, you know, fracturing in cinema. You've been on it longer than I have. Can you do this, what I'm doing in Houdini in cinema? And what he was doing is he was like, basically, um, uh, think about it like he in Houdini, he had some objects spawning on top of a cube. And inside those objects, it would create a point cloud, which would then um, essentially create the fracture. So I was like, yeah, you can do that. Just like throw a cloner and have a cloner become the object that's that's creating the fractures. So I just threw like a, uh, a sphere into a cloner, had the cloner spawn on the object that I'm fracturing. So then all the points are generated inside each individual sphere. And you get this like really, really cool, like clustering of, of shards in very specific kind of places, just keep hitting like random seed to get different effects. That was pretty cool. Like just- Well, I know we brainstormed a little bit about this earlier, but maybe we should combine all these little tips into a video of like, uh, you know, stuff, <laughs> new weird fracture stuff nobody has seen yet. Right. No, that's a good idea for sure. Well, so, you know, this is our first kind of idea going through this as a, as a way for all three of us to talk about this stuff. Um, you know, I thought one of the, we, we kind of maybe have a question every week that we kind of talk about. And uh, Chris actually had a really good one about some of the tools and kind of productivity apps that we use to kind of make sure we're staying on task, make sure we're getting stuff done. You know, um, we have a ton of After Effects, Cinema 4D tutorials coming out soon, but these kind of things are, you know, maybe not going to be videos down the road, but are, are as as important to our workflow as, as I think some of those bigger tools. So I thought maybe we can kind of go through some of these things that keep us, keep us working. What are the other software things that, uh, that you use uh, to do this kind of stuff? I think Chad should start out because he's going to have the most 
<laughs> so he, he, you can do this. You can do you can start and then do the middle and then do the end, and me and Nick can sprinkle a few in between. Oh man. Um, well, I have that video that's going to be coming out soon that kind of goes over some of my favorite window utilities for that stuff. But if we're talking productivity, then for me, it's all about Todoist. Like I think I turned you on to it, Nick. And Todoist is kind of this. Um, it's a list, and I'll put, we can put the link in the uh, description. But it, it's basically, it's as complicated or as simple as you want it as far as like making a list of things that you need to accomplish and check off. And you can make it as simple as like creating you know, a grocery list, or you can dive really deep and create projects and calendars and priorities and, and really get as crazy with it as you want to get. And like literally every day, I have set up, in, so every day I come in and I look at my computer and I open up Todoist and I have reoccurring tasks that happen every day. So like the first one is like check our website comments. Second one is like catch up on email. Third one is I think um, I have another one at five o'clock work on a beta. So like I'm on a couple different betas for different softwares. And so I try to spend at least a half an hour working on one of these betas. So every day I try to like I feel like I get something done by like checking these checks off so to do yeah, Chad, you is you turn me on to todoist and um i love it i i actually do a lot of those reoccurring tasks as well just things i've been trying to do every day even just in general you know like you said email um but also like exercise those kind of things i just put them on there to remind me like what are the things i want to try to uh pull off every day it's really kind of eye-opening to look at a list like that it's been huge we've been using it too a little bit back and forth for uh some to do stuff inside the company as well i think we're going to look more into that yeah it's 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 pretty pretty easy i would say that you know getting up to speed on it you can really learn the ins and outs of it within like 15 minutes so like not a big deal and then the other big thing for me is probably i know a lot of people use um gmail but i started using inbox which is kind of the simpler i think it's where gmail's gonna go i think i've read some articles where google is gonna probably phase out gmail and sort of become inbox and i found that inbox i respond faster and like i'm i'm a little bit more on top of my email game because it's like way simpler from a yeah. ui standpoint yeah you kind of um you push both of those on me pretty hard, actually. <laughs> uh, and, and I have a I, tendency I'm, to do that. I'm pretty reluctant. Um, for any of you guys, uh, by the way, before we get into this, if you want to see the show notes, we're going to have this up on um, the website under the podcast. We're going to try to include everything we talk about in those things. So if you if you don't uh, you know know how to spell Todoist or not sure what we're talking about, check out the uh, uh, show notes either on our website or um, if we release this on YouTube as well, we'll try to include that. But um, you know, you pushed pretty hard to, to kind of move to uh, Gmail, which I was very reluctant to. So oh, yeah, you weren't you out, even, it wasn't even inbox. You didn't want to do Gmail. Dude, yeah, you were against it. Yeah, I'm kind of a um, a little bit of a tinfoil hat Google skeptic, um, but using inbox was a no-brainer. Um, so slowly, the things that I'm okay with Google is like opening more and more. <laughs> I, I guess it was a very slippery <laughs> slope for me. It's like, oh, let's go to, let's put more stuff on YouTube. Let's, uh, Oh yeah, that's right. Now you're going to be, you're going to be oh, like yeah. full entrenched in the Google culture now. You know, to me, um, being early with, with app, uh, Apple Macintosh, all that stuff in the, in the late nineties, it was just always kind of a, like, I need to put all my data in one place and only care about this one, one platform. And for me, it was Apple and they, and really they still do a really good job for me. And when it was just me, when it was, you know, me and and when basically I was putting up all the tutorials on on the website and I, only I had to worry about myself as um, as a business, as a company, as, as anything, it worked great. Um, but what I find with Google is as as you build a team around something, Google just really gives you the, the ability to do that. So if anybody's out there listening or watching and is reluctant um, <laughs> Uh, maybe I could maybe I could be a little <laughs> um, pat on the back for you guys to say it's been really really good, and 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 the transition to Google has been really helpful for me personally and for the team and for everything we've been able to pull off. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I. <laughs> I'm this curious. might be a separate video. I, I gotta. I, I can't. I, I, I'm glad we're recording this because I'm just getting this on video is very. It, it's amusing to me. I'm, I'm curious. This, this... I'm curious if there are even others, Nick. You're the only person I've ever met that was very reluctant about Google ever. <laughs> so you might be. You're like, you hey, you're the last. Uh... And you're the last one. Like, this is <laughs> What's the great? opposite of canary in the coal mine? It's like the the last rock standing. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was an obvious answer from everybody I asked. I'm like, hey, how do I get more organized and how do I do this? They're like, well, you you use Google. I'm like, yeah. well, but what if I don't? They're like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, maybe I am the last. Um, but it's been really uh, – it's it's actually been eye-opening. It's it's changed the way I structure my day. Um, it's changed the way the, the, the team stuff happens. Um, it's really been, it's really been big. So I owe you a high five, Chad. Thanks yeah. for that one. No, you can, that's all good. And then the, 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 one of my favorite features that's actually scary, how useful it is and kind of frightening and, and how inhuman it is, I guess, is, um, in inbox, if you get an email, um, inbox and this now don't, don't freak out. This sounds a little bit big brothery, but it's not essentially what it does. It starts to learn how you how you reply. So if somebody sends you an email and you're like out, maybe you're, you don't have time to like write a huge reply. It gives you three choices, at least on the mobile app. I, I think it does it on the, yeah, it on does the web it on app desktop. Too. So it gives you three choices that are kind of like, it learns how you normally respond. And usually two of them are like an accepting response. And then the third one is like a, a no or something. So you can just like, dude, I can't even tell you how many times like, I've just like, bam, replied when one click, I'm like, I'm on top of this, you know, like it's robo. Sure, that's great. It, yeah. And dude, now, now check this out. Like, so Google's about to announce, um, this new chat application called Allo. So they're taking what they've kind of started with inbox and moving it because Google's never had a good chat application. Like nobody's been able to touch iMessage in terms of like mobile, you know, chatting and texting and stuff like that. So they're coming out with Allo, which is going to have some of that built in. So if you were to like text me like, hey, um, do you want to go see a movie? Um, not only could I, it will it re give me choices of replies and I don't even have to type. I can just be like, yes, no, or maybe next time or whatever it's going to say. But it'll actually, you can call up Google Assistant in the chat and it'll actually show you movie times, and then you can both agree right there in the chat window, which is kind of kind of cool. But yeah, it's crazy, man. Like, pretty soon we'll all just be talking to robots. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll uh, I'll add one for anybody that's doing production, or um, you know, the, basically anybody on on a computer all day. This has been really helpful for me. It's called Rescue Time. Have you guys seen that? Uh, Rescue Time basically uh, looks at every you know application you're using, every website you're heading to, and just kind of starts to mark down um, how long you hang out in all these places. And what I would recommend is just for somebody that's interested in, in, in their like productivity and what they're actually doing all day, is to just go sign up for it. It's free, you can get a free version, uh, install it, and then just let it run for a couple weeks or a month, and then put it on your calendar to just go revisit it. And you could actually go back and you could see like you spent this many hours in Cinema 4D, this many hours in After Effects, this many hours um, on Reddit, this many hours on Facebook, and just really get an overview of where your time is actually spent. Um, that's does, been really cool to see that. Does it break it down per like web page kind of thing? Like if you tab over to one window or a different window? Yeah, it'll go to each uh, website and just track it. So you can actually see how long you're, you know, in YouTube, how long you're, um, you know, for me on, on Facebook, a lot of YouTube stuff recently, we've been switching over to YouTube. Maybe we should talk about that as well on this, but that's been really cool. Um, just to kind of get an overview. I don't really get too detailed with that stuff, but I think an overview of how many hours I worked this week, how many, you know, just how long I've, I've been in front of the computer. Um, and also how productive I've been is, is, has been pretty helpful. Um, I kind of think of it almost like a Fitbit where I don't get really technical on exactly how, how much it is. I just want to see trends. I just look at it as a super trend kind of thing and go like, wow, like we, we really, you know, built a lot of stuff in in cinema 4d this, this month, you know, on that tip, do you remember me telling you about, um, that thing that I backed on uh, on that crowd sourcing 
website. What the hell is it? Called? Oh, Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. The, the Saint device that I remember I told you about that Saint. You, d- you did. Did you get it? I got it. So I was a backer. It was kind of the same, similar idea. It was like, let's get, you know, it was a productivity tool that's supposed to keep you from um, going on what they call bad websites or bad applications. And you can like tell them which ones are bad. And it, it's actually a physical device. I was just w- looking for it. I think I put it in the closet because it, it, here's the bad news. It didn't really work <laughs> the way that it was, <laughs> it was supposed to. Uh, and it was really kind of distracting in itself because it was you know, not working and kind of pissing me off. Um, but the idea behind it was that you would essentially, when you're ready to go into like go mode, like I'm going to like oh, yeah. plow through some work in cinema or something, you would hit this button and it would put you in like this they called it monk mode where you're just like focused like a monk, like on your one task. And if you deviated into another application or maybe a web browser or Facebook, it would warn you, it would say, Hey, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be in here, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but what was nice is that it, you know, it, it served for people that were, are in like a large studio with a bunch of people and having been in a studio like that, we're in an open office environment and you got like 20 people behind you and you've got a big, a lot of hustle and bustle. You don't know when somebody's busy or not. So you don't want to always come up to them and ask them a question. What this device would do is like when you went into monk mode, it would turn red. So the idea of it is kind of like those, you know, those Brazilian steakhouses where you like have a green card and you have a, have a red card. And when you're ready for more meat, you throw up the green card. And when you want the meat to stop, you put it on red. That's what this is. But it's like, I'm on red, so don't come hassle me about like some stupid stuff. Like, Oh, I see. It it actually uh, transmitted to your coworkers, too, that you were like, don't bug me. Well, it was I'm I'm on red mode. It's literally like a white device. I wish I had it. I'll try to find it. Um, It's a white device and it would have a red light on it. I think it was a red light. And so that if I'm walking by your desk and I saw it on, I'd be like, oh, he's, you know, he's in monk mode. I'm not going to disturb him. Um, So it was kind of like that sort of thing. But, you know, now that I kind of I don't really have a whole lot of coworkers here besides the (laughs) blog, um, it didn't really it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But those types of tools are great because it it kind of forces you to look at your habits, I think, which is always good. I'm always curious about those. or like, but you know, when we were in the studio, we just had the headphone rule, which was the same thing. If you see the, the headphones, that means they're plugged yep. in. Except Nick yeah, that, always had his headphones on. So how do you get his attention? Right, that's true. That's when you just kind of raise your head up above the desk, and then <laughs> if he looks at you, then maybe he'll take a sentence <laughs> off, and then you lower back down again. It's like okay. Uh, uh, but let's see. see uh, I mean, a thing, a thing I've been using. Well, uh, I recently got a new PC laptop. But I've been using Chrome for a while. Fire, I used to love Firefox. I switched to Chrome because Firefox started getting slow. Although I heard Firefox has like a new multi-threaded super version coming out soon. Um, but dude, transferring to the new computer was so easy. Like you sign in back into your, you sign back into your account, and like all of your tabs, all of your, it, it was like you didn't switch computer. Everything came along with it. But I know. specifically productivity wise, it's just a tiny thing, but it's been very useful for me is I made two folders at the top of my Chrome. The very first folder is daily. And then the second folder is weekly. And so daily, when I sit down to start my day, I middle mouse button click that, and then it'll open up literally 20 tabs, like 20 tabs across. It says, are you sure you want to do that? And I say, yes. (laughs) That will open up like my tech supports and checking comments on the website and checking the status of half res. Everything I need to check every day opens right up. And then I just close my way through the tabs as I do all the different stuff, pop open different forums. I should just be kind of glancing at, see if anything important popped up. Uh, you check everything. And I have the weekly one, which is like the things that aren't as important. But I want to keep up with it every week. And just something as simple as that has made, you know, that that workflow by itself. I also like keeping up with a lot of web comics. So I'm not allowed to look at any comics until I've completed my tabs. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I like that too. Like I, I, I started using like once I figured out like every day I go to these, you know, four or five sites, I just basically have Chrome automatically load. When it opens, it opens with those five sites active and tabs. And that's a really, that's like, that's, that's right there. That saves you how much time? I don't know, maybe 45 seconds of, you know, going to all these different websites. It's definitely well, a time saver. Uh, well, I, I, I took some notes here as well. If anybody wants to click on any of those things, what's the monk mode thing? Actually, I'll ask you after. 
<laughs> to get the name. Yeah, of yeah, I'll, I'll get it to you. Yeah, yeah, just send me the name. I'm, I'm not sure if they're actually in market right now with it or not. It might still be in kind of beta, but hopefully they've worked out the kinks because the one that I got was definitely not doing what it was supposed to be doing. The other thing uh, that I that I played with too was it didn't actually end up going anywhere, but um, uh, there's a app that you can get for your tablet. And I think I showed it to you guys at least once. Um, but the idea of there's this company, I, I, God, the name's going to slip my mind, but um, I think they were called Quadro, uh, like the graphics card, but not the graphics card. Anyway, so they were saying that like peripherals haven't changed in forever. And like people use a mouse, they use a keyboard and they use a tablet. But, you know, like what about, you know, why hasn't it changed? Why hasn't, why haven't we done anything more? Because we figured it out. Exactly. So, but their idea was like, okay, let's, what if you could use your iPad, like set your iPad next to your keyboard and have different shortcuts or um, modes based on what program you're in, you could create a customizable kind of little uh, UI that you would design yourself and essentially um, create short, you could actually get really into it and like have like a series of commands that would be called by pushing a like a, a button on your iPad, which was kind of cool. I played with it for like mm, like a week or two or something like that, and mm. it was fun. But like, I noticed right away that like, if you already have like a full length keyboard with a number pad, and you've already got like a mouse or or maybe you've got a a, a Wacom or something, you've only got like. I, I'm not a. I don't have like the the wingspan of Nick. You know what I mean? Like my wings. I have a small, much smaller wingspan. So like another peripheral that's even like like two feet away feels like I'm all of a sudden I'm like uh, on the enterprise like trying to like you know twiddle a bunch of knobs that are way too far away, and not so, to mention the iPad the 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 viewing angle would probably be way off at that point. It's so far away that if you were to click, it's not where the iPad thinks you're clicking. Well, it's it's like you I have like one of those um, the the covers that like fold up, you know, so that like mm. tilts it at like okay. an angle like about like that and stuff. So it, it wasn't too bad, but I even like I thought, you know, wow, this is going to be cool. And I even made like a whole cinema 4D. Uh, they call them palettes where you can like customize um, a palette to work in whatever application you have up. So I had a palette where I could like make a new scene in cinema. I could op I could hit render. Um, and then I just thought to myself, like, what am I doing? Like after a while you played with it and you're like, why am I, do I really need this? You know, yeah. it's like one of those things that like sounded really cool and like it, it was different and interesting and the UI was pretty. But then that one day you look at it and you're like, what am I doing? Like, I, I know the shortcut on my keyboard. Like, why am I reaching over here? Yeah. So it's not, like you find like there's certain productivity tools that actually are counterproductive. And yeah, yeah. You're, you're anything that abstracts uh, can go the, the way of like, oh, this is really helpful if it abstracts it in a way that is like useful. But then as soon as it abstracts it to a point where it's just tedious, it, it's like, well, I'll just do the like keyboard shortcut. Right. <laughs> like, I'll just remember that. Or like like Chris has a folder full of, you know, like things he needs to do every day instead of like a, a, an app with a button to press to set it up, you know? Well, yeah, there's, always... there's so much front end work there. Like if I, for my daily tab, I just drag a link in, boom, done. And then tomorrow, one button click, I've got all the tabs. Yours is like, okay, let's sit down for an hour. Oh, wait, you know what? I don't like that button where it is. Let me scoot it over to this spot or remap right. it here. And then reach way over. It's like, no, it's faster to just be right here on my keyboard. I know, man. And that's kind of the way it was too. It was like, I felt like, okay, I think I was just a sucker for like a really good looking UI and it actually is a really, really pretty UI and like it just looked really cool and I'm like, oh man, it's like futuristic having your iPad up next to you and then you're just like, wait a minute, like this is total, you know, uh, form before function yeah. and like it didn't make any sense. So I stopped. It reminds me of those toys like I would really get obsessed about. I really need that toy when I was a kid. But the commercials just made it look so cool. And I'm like, wait, Mike, I, f I remember now my living room doesn't look like like this castle did. <laughs> like <laughs> on once you get it home and on the carpet, it's like, oh, right. never mind. Yeah. No, I mean, like that. that's true, though, because like, I think as designers, we um, we have like this appreciation for 
aesthetically, you know, whatever we find aesthetically pleasing, we, we kind of like almost fall in love with that idea and, and you start chasing the idea and instead of really what, you know, what was, what was it supposed to do? What was its function? And yeah, I find myself now with workflow stuff, trying to simplify and not complicate, I guess. Whatever has the fewest number of clicks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I, I already have like four more things I could talk about. I, maybe this should be um, at least every other week or so. We just all bring one to the table and kind of describe it. Because I think we all, you know, are using computers all day and it's it's just constant, right? You know, um, so maybe maybe we think about this every, every week, just kind of bring one and describe how it helps our workflow and kind of talk about it that way. Does that sound good? Works for me. Cool. Sweet. Well, with the time we got, um, I figured we'd do some Grayscale Gorilla news. We got a lot of stuff coming up in the next week there, and uh, and then see where it goes from there. You know, hey folks, we're 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 making this up as we go along <laughs> a little bit, uh, but I think as we figure this out, it'll drive the structure, and that's actually a good point. If you guys have a topic or anything. Um, you know, you you guys are listening to this, going like, I really wish you guys would actually talk about these things. Drop them in the comments, put it on YouTube um, or on the blog post here, uh, where the show notes are, which will be on Grayscale Gorilla under podcast. Um, if you just search podcast, one of these episodes should pop up. Um, in GSG news, we got half res. That's probably the biggest thing in the next week. It's a, That's uh, the big one. Uh, September 14th in Chicago in the Midwest, if you're around, it's a, uh, a motion, basically a motion graphics conference. It, it started off as, um, there you go. <laughs> it started off um, as kind of a celebration of the Chicago C4D scene once a year to kind of build a, a larger um, the thing big, every year. Yeah, big blowout meetup. Yeah, like the, the, the big celebration meetup. And it's really turned into... Um, this this incredible conference more and more people every year show up to it um if you want to go all you have to do is just go sign up at halfres.com i'm going to put that in the show notes as well and uh this year is the 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 people that are coming out that i'm talking to is just really cool um people that uh we haven't seen come out we got we got a rumor a uh, pretty pretty strong rumor here i think beeple will be there and what? uh yeah, so I think we're going to do a Q&A with Beeple. So if you're listening to this podcast and have a question for Beeple, hit me up on, uh, hit up Grayscale Gorilla on Twitter. Make sure you put in half res, uh, the hashtag half res, so that we can um, kind of see it. And then ask Beeple a question, because I'll be on stage with him asking some questions. That'll be super fun. Um, he's right up in Wisconsin, so he's traveling down to Chicago. Yeah, where in Wisconsin is? Where does he live in Wisconsin? I was trying to figure that out. Well, write that question to Twitter at hashtag Hafrid. <laughs> Let's ask him. Where do you live again? Um, he's been making incredible stuff. That one with the running, like um, uh, people with the butts hanging out, was oh, yeah. like my favorite thing he's made in a couple years. It's just so adorable. Um, I love that thing. We'll link that that up as well. We'll link up half res. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm like taking notes in my head to type all this. <laughs> there we go. Um, but half res is big. Um, this year's theme is all about the kind of the past of where we came from and into the future and where we're going. We're at kind of a, a big transition, I feel, with all these new renders coming out and all this technology and then the, the, the GPU, CPU stuff that's happening. We're really getting into this point where 3D in general is kind of um, uh, becoming almost a new thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Chad has a presentation. Chris has a presentation um, all about uh, uh, early versions of Cinema 4D. And uh, Chad, what are you talking about at Half Res? Uh, I'm going to just kind of talk about how... The state of 3D, I think, is kind of um, is a really exciting time, and how technology and both hardware and software have kind of democratized 3D. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where 3D was, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, and how different it is now, um, and how exciting it is to kind of like be able to do the things that we're able to do these days that were unheard of 10, 15 years ago. And just kind of a yeah, just kind of a state of the union of where we are as an industry. That'll that'll be great. Um, 
Then we have uh, Nick and Eric from Run, Kick, Shout. They're going to do a presentation all about uh, kind of the business side of, of, of this industry. They recently started a... Uh, a studio, I guess you would call it. Yeah. And they're going to go through, you know, some of the things they went through to, to uh, make their own um, motion design 3D studio. And uh, and then, of course, we got Beeple on stage. Uh, I'm going to try to feed him as many beers as possible and then uh, <laughs> ask him some questions. So keep those coming. Um, so that's Half Res, September 14th. If you haven't, uh, if you're listening to this before then, get your butt to Chicago. We'd love to see you. People fly in from all over um, to to come hang out. So we'd love to have you there. Prizes. And, uh, oh, yeah. We got tons oh, of awesome sponsors prizes. and prizes. We're going to actually have a blog post out in the next uh, week or so all about the, the sponsors and the prizes. So uh, I'm going to link that up in the show notes as well. So thanks to all of them um, for making it happen. And if you're, and if you you're in Chicago, make sure you actually sign up so we can see how many people are coming. That's an important note. Don't just assume like, oh, I'll just show up. No, no. Sign up. Tell your friends. Tell the other coworkers in the studio. We have room to grow. So, um, you know. There so have definitely been venue. years we'd have, we have to push people away. Yeah. No, um, we, we turn people away. That's why we keep on growing the venue bigger and bigger and bigger. But this time we did a big jump so we could stay here for a few years. Yeah, yeah let us know. The venue is awesome, actually. It's a really cool venue. And if you're listening to this and it's not 2000, uh, the, the uh, middle of 2016, um, join us next year. Sign up. Halfres.com. Be there. Uh, it is fun. Um, we also, uh, what else are we working on? We're working on, this is a little behind the scenes, I guess. Maybe this is interesting to people. We're working on a new store and a new site in general. So we're actually uh, cleaning up some of the WordPress stuff behind the scenes. Uh, moving to a new store system, cart system, that should make things a lot easier, not just for customers coming in, but uh, for on our side as well, uh, changing images and videos and really adding new stuff to the store. So that'll be um, in the next month or so. Keep an eye out for that. Um, and then we got uh, HDR, HDRI Link. I know we've been talking a lot about in the last uh, six months or so. I think we introduced it at NAB. Was that right? Yep, that was the first time we showed it. So that, um, you know, image-based lighting, especially with all these new renderers popping up, is really kind of taken off. Um, and especially with uh, GPU rendering, it kind of sped it up a lot. Image-based uh, lighting used to really, you needed GI basically to run it, uh, to make it look really good. And, and, and a lot of us learning on a laptop or on an iMac just really didn't have the horsepower to take advantage of it. And I think with this new GPU movement, with the new physical render, with a lot of these things, image-based lighting really kind of took off. And HDRI Link is a way for us to um, actually make it available to all um, to all the renderers and, and really make it fast, make that setup really quick. So I guess this demo is a little bit more visual than what we could do here but look look for a lot of news uh with link we're really excited about it we started uh shipping it out to some beta users to to test and we've gotten some beautiful stuff back th through octane through arnold um so look look for that uh really soon any other hdri link news from you guys it's really amazing <laughs> and i can't it's really i can't wait to get it out because i think that it's a. I think I, I probably have used it on almost every single thing that I've done since we start since NAB probably like every render every thing that I'm lighting or anything it's starting with that and then maybe I'm adding a few other like lights here and there but I think yeah it's exciting to number one it's exciting because it's really fun to use but then the way that uh, Chris and the development team built it it's so versatile and I, I'm on beta for a lot of different renderers and every I have not found a renderer yet that it does not work with yeah it's it's been fun to watch uh, Chris and the team did a, a great job on it and it's you know for those of you thinking like I haven't seen this thing what are they talking about <laughs> um, you know when we built the latest version of HDRI studio um, what really stood out is the the, the new browser system. So what that gives us the ability to do is open up a browser full of HDRs, right? Um, and you could choose what packs and stuff you, you, you own. 
And the the real key of it is opening up a browser and clicking on some of the lighting setups and instantly being able to see it in cinema. And you know my spiel on you know, seeing as soon as possible, like what your difference is in, in lighting and texturing and all that stuff, the ability to load up a bunch of different HDRs and, and kind of test them out and give them a trial in your scene is really powerful, especially when you're like, all right, what, what, what is, what should this look like? And you can open up dozens and check out the lighting. It's, it's even more powerful in something like Arnold and Octane where the results can be seen in like milliseconds, <laughs> like when you click it and it just starts popping up. So if you imagine, you know, a browser full of HDRs uh, that you can kind of demo on your current scene, um, that's where HDR, HDRI link is going. It'll be uh, really fun. I'm re excited to show off more of that. Yeah, I think that it solved that problem for me where like, Oh, I want to look for an HDRI to like light the scene. Let me like hit file browse. And on PC, you can't see an HDR or an EXR in a file browser. You like you have That's no true. idea what it looks like until you open it up. And by then you've already gone through the process of like clicking on it opening it, waiting for it to reload and refresh and then seeing right. it. And then you're like, now nah, that's not the one I want. And, and then and you start that yeah, and, and you just keep doing that process over again. Um, so unless you know which map you want to use and you use the same one all the time, which I don't, I like to vary it up. Um, that process is a big pain, but this takes that pain away and makes it much faster to audition different HDRIs and stuff for uh, for me. I mean, I didn't do a lot of HDR stuff or ever GI, um, but I just remember like whenever I wanted an HDR, it'd be like, okay, go to the, go to the Finder window, search dot HDR, whichever one pops up, that's what's going in. Like, and it's like, oh, do you, you want to copy it in your scene file? And then so I had the same one. It was that like that kitchen HDR that came with Cinema or something a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I have like thirty copies of that just in different folders. Where and now it's like, nope, like just going right through and i think david uh is going to explode if we don't get link out soon because he wants to show it off because he's using it i think more than you do chad yeah i think yeah i mean and when you play with it in octane like the way david and i have like you know and you have multiple graphics cards and whatnot it's insane like just like it, it it's like instant like oh let me try this one let me try that one let me try this one let me try that one and you start to like go a little like crazy trying a million of them um, yeah, we're, we're excited. Hope I, I dare not say another date on uh, on Link. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm scared to say anything since I'm on development on that. Like, I, I'm not sure what's <laughs> safe to talk about. <laughs> if anybody awesome. wants a feature, you know, just drop it in the comments. And... Oh boy, no, 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 no. <laughs> no we are uh, Link is um, getting really close, and um, we're excited to get that out. That's that's going to be really fun to get out there and just see how all the stuff that people use it like just like David you know David Brodeur and his uh, Instagram feed has been going nuts lately with really cool octane stuff and it's it's just cool to hear that he uses it on every one is he coming out uh, to happen yeah he'll be there Sweet. wait yeah yeah he, he will be there Hope so. I think so yeah he said he was um and uh so yeah oh I wanted to also mention um I have been doing a Facebook Live video, so if you're not sick of my face or voice yet, um, check out our Facebook page. I've been doing like an hour of Q&A uh, on Fridays just to say hi, and I've also been talking a little bit about you know some of the ways to um, you know get a job and and kind of learn about the career of motion design and not just the tools, but you know really learn all the different types of things. Um, that you really need to learn to to do this for a living to, to to make this stuff and get a job so i used to do a lot more of that um back in whenever that was uh oh oh eight no oh nine 2010 is it oh ten it's not oh ten oh ten yeah it's the oh tens the aughts um, back in the aughts but uh, I think you know, getting more into that, that's kind of why this this format I think is interesting to really start learning some of the things that are not necessarily all about. Um, just Cinema 4D to really get uh, a wider um, uh, kind of knowledge base on some of the things you, you might want to learn about to to do this for a living, you know, or to get better at it or to get better clients and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think half res will be a huge part of that, getting those guys there. And then also these kind of these kind of things as well. So um, I also have here new stuff on YouTube. So uh, oh, if you haven't checked one. out our YouTube channel, 
we have been uh, putting out a ton of new stuff. In fact, I think in the last uh, month, there's been over uh, 10, 15 new videos over there. So if you haven't checked it out, um, we've also been kind of remastering some of our favorite tutorials and putting them on YouTube as well. So what was that old NBC thing? Like if you haven't seen it, it's new to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so check, check that out. Um, the there's been some really cool. Yeah. Some, uh, some classics, some GSG classics out of really. the GSG vault comes. That's right. Here you go. <laughs> Mograph. You know, it's really cool. Um, the only thing you have to watch out for with, well, one of the big things you have to watch out for with watching older tutorials is really just the reflection channel. Almost everything else, uh, Maxon's done a really good job of kind of keeping things where they are, naming, keeping the naming of things where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say things like hypernerbs, um, used was it used to be called hypernerbs? Yeah, and now, now it's subdivision surface. Now it's subdivision surface. So if you ever see that in a tutorial, they moved the dynamic stuff early on. Um, so all the early Mo dynamics stuff used to be um, set up a little bit different than it has is now. But over the last six years, it's been similar. But really, it's reflection and reflectance is really the big one. How many hundred tutorials have I done where I go make a reflection mm -hmm. in uh, using the reflection channel, and now it's called reflectance? So well, literally that, every single one of your tutorials. <laughs> what, are yeah, you what are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm, like I'm pretty new to it, so like I don't, I, I don't see. I guess yeah, I'm not. I don't experience that as much. I guess. But it is pretty. Uh, it's pretty insane. If that's the only thing that's really that different over this many years, like that's pretty good. I, I gotta say, yeah. I've been tinkering with an old version of Cinema, getting ready for my presentation, and oh, that's right. Like, they've added in new. Like, there's a simulation drop down now, and then there's like different drop downs that didn't used to be there. But all the old ones are still there, and all, like 99% of the time, the same buttons are in there, and everything's been consistent. So, hmm. yeah, there. It's. Other, I think other than render settings would be the only other thing, like the way physical render settings yeah. are much different than the old GI settings. Mm -hmm. And also in right the way that, G, yeah, GI almost goes away uh, with the new physical and the new reflectance as well. So that's something that could get a little confusing to some of you. But I think with all these new renders popping up, there's really going to be a, a kind of, you know, way to make tutorials that's like, all right, we made we made everything move and we made it all work. And now what? <laughs> what render are we going to use? Um, the it's render gonna be, It's going to be interesting. Well, um, so that's that's what's going on in Grayscale Gorilla. We, we went through some lists here, and um, maybe we could leave everybody with something uh, fun, you know, that they're either maybe a little unrelated, a little bit about what you've been up to, uh, you know, outside of work or anything. Anything fun you guys seen or something online or something offline um, that uh, you've been interested in? Chad, we'll start with you. Oh, you put me on the spot. Um, Going straight to you, buddy. I just realized now we haven't introduced anybody. Yeah, I, I was so, thinking about yeah, that. I was thinking about it. <laughs> people <laughs> listening. I'm sure so, you're going to record an intro. So. Well, so this is Chad. This is what Chad sounds like. Hi, I am Chad. <laughs> this is what Chris sounds like. Hello, this is Chris. And this is what Nick sounds like. Hey, it's Nick here. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll put that at the beginning. <laughs> um <laughs> Anything, anything fun uh, uh, off the line? Mm, uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to teach myself to do hard surface modeling in a NURBS modeling program, and that's only because I'm a huge fan. You guys know this artist uh, Vitaly Bulgarov? Do you know that guy? Mm -mm. So, put it in the notes. Yeah, Vitaly. Um, I, I'm probably butchering his name, but I think his name is Vitaly Bulgarov. He's a concept artist that does these amazing killer mech robot models. And he he sells yeah, my attention. he sells like um, kit bashes of like different parts and pieces that you can buy. And um, I've been following him for a while and I not that long ago I, I listened to a podcast. I think it was um, I want to say it was uh, Oh God, Ash Thorpe did on his podcast. He interviewed him and talked a bit about his process. And he mentioned that he uses like a hard surface NURBS modeling program. I think he used either MOI or 
um, like a Fusion 360 modeling program. So I made, um, I'm making myself like, and I kind of already knew MOI, which is like a NURB space modeling, but I, it, I don't own it anymore. So I'm trying to like teach myself that again and like make myself learn that just, just because it's fascinating to me. That's it for me. Chris, what have you been up to, man? Uh, let's see. I spent far too much time over the weekend watching an old, uh, a YouTuber I used to follow back in the day. And I unsubscribed because I kind of got disinterested and I went and checked back into all their old videos. And this is a little bit off the grid, uh, but his name is uh, Jamie Mantzell. Uh, and I'll send you the link for that. But he's like this, I don't know, he's like this, he's this awesome, crazy guy who like lives off the grid and like, builds his own like hydroelectric stuff and then he just moved from the United States to like somewhere in Central America or something and he's he built his a boat from just fiberglass from scratch he just lays out a sheet of metal he paints it and built this giant pontoon boat and like uh, like he's just com he's a crazy guy and he does what he wants to do all the time and he's nuts and it's just <laughs> a lot of fun watching his videos like so he goes a little off the rails sometimes uh, for, for stuff I would do but like it, a lot of it's just really inspiring where it's like I don't think I could ever do that but he like bought an island in the middle of nowhere, like twenty five acres, and he's building boats and building a house and building a castle on an island because he thinks it would be cool. Like he he wow. programs video games and sells like robot parts and just does so many crazy off the wall things. It's just a lot of fun to watch. So I spent far too many hours catching up on like two years worth of his videos. I love when you find somebody like that that you kind of uh, obsess over and then you realize they have like four years worth of stuff and you're like oh yeah. this is this is now my weekend <laughs> um, yeah it's, it's funny how youtube has kind of become that you know like it's a it's a place where you can like literally just not stop watching some subject matter yeah and they've been doing really a uh, good job with like the recommendation kind of stuff you could just you kind of trust them in a way they, they really recommend some good stuff yeah and there's so much good content now well, and we, we don't have time, I think, in this one for it. But at some point, I want one of these to be us talking about our favorite kind of content like that. Because I don't have TV anymore. TV, I just do YouTube. And I, I always need more channels to follow. And I probably already have all the ones everybody's going to suggest. But I always want more. So we'll do yeah, that some I, other time. Hmm. Yeah, now right. I'm challenged to, to stump you. See, yep. now, yeah, I instantly have three of them in my head. So I'm going to write those down. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do that <laughs> next time. But, Is uh, that what Nick, they call Nick a teaser? Um, so I... Um, I have been uh, reading all the uh, Austin Kleon books, um, the uh, uh, Steal Like an Artist, and then mm -hmm. um, sh I think the other one's called Share Like an Artist. Um, he also has a Steal Like an Artist journal, uh, and I once I got into him, I just got all three of uh, of his books, and I've been I've always liked books like that, uh, books like uh, It's Not How Good You Are, It's How Good You Think You Are. I think is what the other one is called. I'm going to try to link all these up. Uh, really short books that just give you a mindset of how to approach your work and how to approach uh, kind of living in a way. A lot of that stuff's kind of abstracted out to just how to live your life with more like openness. Um, I love books like that. So he's been really cool. I've been kind of rereading through those. I, I tend to usually listen to books, um, but with a book like that, it's just so... Um, they either not don't exist on audio form or they're just such short reads that it just makes sense to have. So I would recommend those books for sure. Um, the other thing is that has popped up in my head recently is, is, uh, just drones like drone filming. So somehow in the last year they went from these more like complicated things to steer and control and set up to now with something like the Phantom 4, which I'm researching right now, uh, partly because our, our buddy uh, uh, Brad Chmielewski got one and is <laughs> is like live streaming it every day. It's been really interesting. Oh, yeah. um, so I've just been doing research on that, looking at how easy those things are now to, to kind of get off the ground literally and start filming. The cameras are all built in. They, they, they have these iPad apps. Um, I'm sure many of you know this stuff, but as you could tell with the Google stuff, I, uh, I tend to be a little bit behind sometimes. Um, this, it's been really cool just to see how easy that stuff is and really understanding that it's not, it's not going to be difficult to make these things work. It's really about the art you can make with them. So, um, just thinking about it in that way. Um, 
you know, and every every time you every time I get into these things, you 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 start meeting other people that are into it, kind of by accident. I just happen to sit down next to somebody that races drones every weekend, mm-hmm. and so I had a long conversation with them and what's been going on with that scene. So that's just kind of stuff I randomly get interested in. I'll try to link up some of these uh, uh, drone racing. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's uh, that was my weekend. And, um, and, uh, yeah. All right. We, we got to wrap this up like in 30 seconds, my computer's saying the hard drive is about to explode from being full. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's as good a reason as any guys. Thanks. Uh, we'll do this again. And, uh, thank you guys for, for stopping in. And from all of us here at Grayscale Gorilla, we'll see you in another podcast really soon. Is this where we wave? Everybody wave. Bye bye everybody. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now. I have to. Bye. Cooper, come say goodbye. No? All right. Fine. <laughs> well, that's, that's one way to end it forcefully. Yep. All right. I'm going to hit stop. <laughs>